Welcome to Alternative Displays. My name is Timothy Lars, and this is the Neo Kino Graphics Channel. So Vintage Era Low Resolution CRTs, based on NTSC TV tubes, enabled the early era of computing devices, both for gaming and personal computers. If one wanted to bring up a new FPGA-based computer for 3D graphics today, one wouldn't have the performance for 4K output. And thus, we really need to have an alternative for CRT replacement for low-res output. And note, Mr. is enabled to do GameCube today, likely due to the fact that the CPU frequency is so high at 486 MHz. However, FPGAs tend to have enough parallelism for GameCube resolution. So if we look at vintage progressive NTSC limits, those cheap RGB CRTs kept costs down in the arcades for a long time, long after PCs have been pushing huge VGA resolutions. Most common resolutions in the arcade were 256 by 224 and 320 by 224. The near 60 Hz provided great motion clarity and the whole thing came without high pixel rate. It's easier to author pixel art at the lower resolutions and we have less expensive hardware overall. I think limitations amplified creativity via an addictive cycle of tuning to perfection. So the crux of display technology today is they're only manufacturing the high resolution stuff. We don't have the low res. And the approachability of hardware is directly proportional to resolution, similar for graphics algorithms. The default solution of this is to use a modern OLED. However, we would need a hardware scaler for this, or we would need to put the scaler in the device itself. And note, even the external scalers have a hard time going above 4K at 60 Hertz due to the insane pixel rates don't necessarily want to burn a whole FPGA for scaling to 4K, and to compound the problem, at low resolution, scaling is out. Graphics must target the native resolution. NES, SNES, Mega Drive, etc., they all have a wide range of resolutions because CRTs at that era were analog devices. Resolution is flexible. Some of the devices would support multiple resolutions, and even some would switch midway in the games. Most CRT alternatives today would be fixed resolution, and this presents another big problem. It wouldn't really work in the retro console industry. You can't increase your volume by selling to people that say want to attach them to a NES and a Mega Drive and a Super Nintendo and maybe a Neo Geo. Pixel art cheats on resolution, features stay aligned to pixels, and thus it has double the effect of real resolution. Video cannot cheat on resolution, features flow across pixels. So we look at the example below of a white single pixel feature moving vertically. At some point, it's going to be double pixel wide and half contrast. I think this means we need different minimum resolution for 2D pixel art and 3D that's greatly anti-alias. Since CRT resolutions are a messy topic due to overscan, thus I'm going to bump to the nearest typical VGA number for ease of conversation. 240p, that would be the N64 size, and I think that's a little too low for 3D. If we double the horizontal resolution to 640, that makes a big difference. It's similar to the difference between the PGM Master 1 and the Super Nintendo. If then we bump the vertical up to 480i, this would be similar to what we get on a GameCube. And that looks quite good with anti-aliasing on modern CRT TVs. If we want to go beyond NTSC, the next one would be 480p, and that would remove the interlacing artifacts. Now these are all 4x3 aspect. If we want to go to 16x9, the comparison would be 640x360. That would be similar to a 16x9 Laserdisc. That's letterbox. So the topic that started this whole thing was CRTs are gone, what do we use? In some respects, CRTs are still used in aerospace and defense, but it seems like it's all likely the monochromatic projection tubes. Looking at Thomas Electronics, it seems to be the case if you look at their pictures. If you look at their refurbished CRTs, they're all small CRT projection tubes. So while people have built the boards, the tubes are a real problem. No one makes large tubes today. All new tubes are recycled from existing devices, to my knowledge. Color CRTs are probably an impossibility today for manufacturing because of the mask or the grill. Monochrome seems like it might be possible. 
After all, all that needs is a uniform phosphor layer. So the nearest solution for CRTs is probably start looking at laser scanning. One of the latest ones was AnyBeam. I bought one of these. Marketing claims 720p, that's actually a lie. They also said 60 hertz, that part is true. The nice thing about it, it's a laser device, it has zero persistence, it's quite amazing. It does have an insane color gamut due to its narrow band lasers. I'm making an assumption that this is probably in the microvision family. My understanding is microvision had a patent related to this kind of MEMS based laser scanning. I think Cellulon, i.e. the Pico Pro, is another microvision product or a microvision licensee. And I'm assuming any beam is in the same category. Carl Gutag, I'm probably saying his name wrong, he has a great diagram of the Cellulon. If you notice, it actually has five lasers, two for red and two for green. That probably makes it so that it, the human observer sees similar color, because if you just had one really strong narrow band, you might get differences from different observers. So I'll be showing some real captures here. These are projected on my wall. Unfortunately, my wall is highly textured. And it took the captures with the bad Android phone. This phone has issues capturing neural band illumination and it has problems with focus. And to top it off, YouTube is gonna compress all this again. So I'm sorry if the images didn't turn out too well. So any beam has a crazy gamut. You can see a big difference in the same picture captured on two different displays with the same camera. The laptop LCD is on the left side and the right side shows the AnyBeam. The AnyBeam, while it looks blue, it actually was purple through the whole background. And the other thing that's obvious on this is that there's some seriously bad pulsarization in the darks on the AnyBeam. In fact, there's a step function. All the darks in the low end shadows get cut off and they turn into black. So another thing I noticed about this device is the resolution. It's definitely not 720p. One way you can verify this is go to Demofox's website and pull some of his dither textures and then look at them at 720p native with no scaling. If you look at these, you notice there's a pattern and the pattern isn't in the texture. The pattern is something that's synthetically showing up on the screen above the texture at a lower frequency. In my mind, I think this is non-energy conserving downsampling that's happening here. So I don't know the real resolution at this point. However, I did try adjusting the browser scale on the image until the pattern went away. And somewhere around 125%, the pattern of distortion on the actual output went away. This kind of suggests that the real resolution might be closer to say 576p. And that may not be true, but at least the device says it supports 720p, 480p, and 567. However, we're going to need a line count to actually get a verification. So another problem here is the dark pulsarization. And I think this is actually a fixable problem. So of course I go into shader toy and I start playing with dithering. So I was able to fix pulsarization in the darks for GPU gen content if I'm using a four bit per channel energy conserving spatial temporal dither. Of course I had to scale up the dither to two by two pixels for the grain size and that's due to the resolution lie. But once I did that, I actually got some good output. And so I took an image here and then I artificially brightened it, but I realized this is a problem due to the fact that the sensor and the camera is linear and the banding is linear, so they kind of clash. But hopefully this will transmit over YouTube. Anyway, at the bottom, you get a spatial dither. In the middle, you get no dither, and that shows the banding. And at the top, there's the spatial temporal dither, and that actually shows a good gradient all the way from white to black. Microvision, the patent owner, they get roasted all the time. Carl Gutag roasts Cellulon for fixed beam thickness. So when you have a small projection, the image is really blurry. And when you go to a large projection, you're going to have some scan separation. I'd say this is closer to what CRTs would do, so I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. It's definitely not good for a 12 inch diagonal image though. Now he roasts them for being blurry at 720p, saying never in focus technology, but it didn't seem like he counted separated scan. And if you look at his image with the 72 inch diagonal, 
it looks like it actually resolves the vertical 720p because at its lowest swatch of four dark lines, you actually see four dark lines. So in my analysis of any beam, I have the device set up and I didn't bother calibrating convergence. So it's actually easy to see the scan separation. Now I couldn't see the smallest swatch, the one that's just the four lines at one pixel thickness. Those look like blurry boxes. So I just started working on the two pixel thickness one and the four rec pattern, the vertical stacked one. That should be 14 scan lines tall, but in the photo, I actually read seven. And then if I go to the three pixel thickness one, the four stack should be 21 scan lines tall from black to black, but I read 10 in the photo. This suggests to me that the real resolution is closer to 360p. So if there's any conclusions to draw here, of course, this company doesn't make them anymore. You can't buy them. Perhaps they're out of business. I don't know for sure. Any beam definitely lied about resolution, and the resolution is way lower than the Cellulon Pico Pro. They also failed with their nonlinear scaling, apparently, and they botched the dark tonal gradients. Yet, with the tonal workaround I found, I really like this device. If they would have just offered only a native resolution scan, this thing would have been a wonderful CRT replacement for dark rooms. If we try to dive into why the thing has problems with its darks, we can come up with a scenario, and let's say the device operates at one bit per channel, but at 3840 hertz. So if we're running at 60 hertz actual, that means we have 64 subframes of one bit linear. And the smallest value for a value in a frame given it's on just for one subframe, that's going to be 1 64th in linear. And then if we try to convert that into perceptual, and we'll just ballpark that with the gamma 2, that's going to be 1 8th, which means it's actually quite bright. And you'd get a step function long before you hit black, and you'd have severe polsterization all the way through the shadows. I think the feedback here is any device doing pulse width modulation is going to need both good spatial and temporal noise, something the any beam does not have. Perhaps the reason why they didn't dive into doing dithering is that PWM in motion is actually quite hard. My old Panasonic ZT60 Plasma is probably top of the line in terms of still image shadow quality. I think it had something like for uh, maybe 40,000 to 1 in terms of contrast. However, you could see it. It was dithered. And this thing had serious issues in motion. So if we go back to the prior example of 1 64th linear value as the minimum in one frame, to get darker, we're going to have to distribute the energy across multiple frames. The display isn't tracking energy accumulation in motion. It just seems the pixels are in the same spot in every frame. However, as the pixel moves, it's going to be in a different PWM phase, and that's not going to be energy conserving. Meaning what will happen is you've, you're in some cycle of pulse width modulation where you're doing a little bit more energy on some frames and a lot less on other ones, and then you're cutting up these cycles and then you're taping them together randomly. And of course, you're going to get areas where you're above and you're below, and then that's going to show up in the actual image in motion. One thing this suggests to me is that maybe a 3D renderer could actually do better than the display because the 3D renderer potentially would have the motion vector field. So now if we move on to laser scanning, but actually scanning into a phosphor, that patent is owned by PRISM, so nobody else can manufacture one. The problem here is that PRISM only makes tiled display rolls, so these are priced out of the consumer market completely. The other thing is that they're making tiled display walls, so they're going to be designing for a thick beam. And if you look at their individual tiles, resolutions are like 320 by 240 or 427 by 320, and it's a 25 inch diagonal. So the beams are actually pretty thick, meaning they're probably not that great if you actually try to pull them out and use a single tile as a screen. So now we're going to shift to homebrew. Here's Bitluni's Labs Vector Display. This is not MEM space, so it's not like the Pico projectors, but it's Galvo based, and he's using a lens to expand the display size. I did find one example of somebody building a homemade scanning laser color projector TV, 
One alternative is to start using light show hardware for scanning lasers. If you note, NTSC is close to 15.7 kHz, and that's enough for two 62 lines at around 60 Hz. Light show scanning galvanometers hit 20k to 60k points per second. They do have a limited viewing angle based on speed, so for example, perhaps 20,000 points per second at 20 degrees, and then 35,000 points per second at 5 degrees. And another problem is that you probably need a lens to enlarge. For instance, a 1 foot tall 5 degree scan would require almost 12 foot of projection distance, which would be a challenge. I think the way to go and tackle this would be to actually do a panoramic aspect ratio, so do something that's really wide angle, and do it with a triangle scan instead of the saw scan of a CRT. So flip the scan vertically. Use the maximum angle at the slower frequency axis. Have the vertical scan reverse direction for even and odd lines, and thus no blanking. And then digitally generate a pre-warped and pre-amplified image that would compensate for the variable velocity of the actual scan. So scanning lasers, they do seem like the right solution space. In theory, one would be able to adjust the scan for different resolutions, so at least you get that aspect of a CRT back. However, it feels like the entire industry is so encumbered by patents that it's in a, some type of technological gridlock for anything sold to the public. Meaning, I think to make forward progress here, we have to do some hardcore DYI. Maybe as a backup, we should start looking into LED signage i.e. go out to Singapore and Bangkok and see the giant display walls, what if we were to actually grab an individual tile or panel? I went online and I picked up some random reseller, Watchfire, and looked at what their panels are. The 0.9mm dot pitch panel is 360 by 640. So if we were to flip that, it would be similar to something like an any beam. This is a 27-inch panel diagonal. It has 1,000 nits and a 3,840 Hz display update. So we'd have the PWM problems. Maybe the solution is not using the typical IP network that they run at the high level on these displays. Maybe we could even bypass the PWM middle level where they have that card driving the actual modules. Instead, actually try directly targeting the modules using the 16-bit ribbon that's feeding the shift registers. 